James chapter one. I want to do kind of backtrack a hair from our discussion last week. I don't think I made very clear why I personally believe this is the first chronological book of the New Testament. There is amongst the experts, and I'm by no means of an expert, but there is discussion and disagreement. It doesn't affect the book. As to whether Galatians was the first book or James was the first book. And what I was trying to explain, and I didn't do a very good job of it for that, which I apologize, that there are two views to the book of Galatians. One is the North Galatian view, which is the one I hold to that says that the book was written after the book of Romans. And the reason I argue that is because if you have ever read Romans and read Galatians, you are tempted to say that Galatians is actually just another six chapters of Romans. They are, there are so many things said similarly in the book. There are so many things that complement one another. However, there are, there are those who hold the South Galatian view, and that would put the book written at about 49 A.D. James wrote his book anywhere between 44 and 50, probably 40, 45 A.D., um, and I still hold to the fact that that James was the first book. I love James for a lot of reasons I told you last week, but the one really reason I love the book of James is, is just how plain he is. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't get too fluffy. He doesn't get too stuffy. He, he just gets to the meat of the fact. And when you look at, at James, uh, the half brother of our Lord, I, I'd love to tell you when he, obeyed the gospel. I can't tell you that. Uh, but there are so many things that he puts in this book that are going to remind you of what Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount. And was he there for the Sermon on the Mount? Don't know. Uh, I know the Holy Spirit inspired James, even though Martin Luther thought he didn't. Martin Luther took issue with chapter 2 and verse 26. Actually, chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, but that's what he took issue with. And the the text says, faith without, so as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Well, he got it in his head that James and Paul were arguing and contradicting each other. And so Martin Luther says, well, Paul made more sense than, than James did uh, because when you read Romans 4, for example, and, I mean, it's faith only, Martin Luther said. Well, you and I know the only, only there is that's biblical is that there's only one name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. So this concept that, that James and Paul were, were arguing and contradictory led Martin Luther to just simply write the book off. It's not an inspired book. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not true. He also didn't think the book of Esther was an inspired book because there are no references to God. And uh, what there's one other book that he always regarded as not biblical and I can't think of it off the top of my head but how Martin Luther was as smart as he was and he was I mean you don't write 95 theses I said that one time and the kid thought I was saying something else 
theses, T-H-E-S-E-S, you know, write, write 95 of those things and then put them on the door of the, of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg. Of course, he was subsequently excommunicated then. Uh, James and Paul are not arguing. James just simply says faith without works is dead. Paul said works without faith is dead. Now, here's the question. What's the difference? There is none. There's no difference. Now, there are people who do what they do spiritually or religiously, and they have no clue why they do it, except mom and dad did it. Our grandma did it. Grandpa did it. And, you know, if it's good enough for them, it's got to be good enough for me. And you, you kind of scratch your head. Well, why? I mean, we make too big a deal, members of the church have told me. We make too big a deal out of doing things biblically. And I'm like, how can you make, how can you make a big deal out of, out of doing things biblically? We just want to do it the way God wants. So, uh, so when James writes this book, there's some just, I mean, shocking things, uh, scandalous things that are happening in this book. And we want to just kind of backtrack a little in chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll go down to verse 17 tonight, or 18, I'm sorry, and we will tie that together uh, with next week's lesson a little bit and then come back to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time tonight. We pray that we use the time wisely. And Father, we thank you so much for all of those who need our prayers tonight because we get to pray for them. We get to make the requests that we get to make. We get to do the things that we get to do only because of your grace, mercy, and love and our obedience to your will. So we stand firm in the throne of grace, realizing it's not something we've earned, but it's a gift. Father, there are so many that need you, need your love and care. We pray that you'll help us to be used in some way before it's eternally too late for them. Bless us tonight, please, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. James, a slave, born into slavery. He became the one of the slaves for Jesus, his half-brother. This is the same James, along with his brother Judas, and we know him as Jude. Judas was his Jewish name. Jude, Jude is his Gentile name. And they both were two of the brothers that said, we don't want anything to do with this guy. This guy is an embarrassment to the family. Uh, you know, when when you turn around and say he's a carpenter's son, well, he's not our brother. And they made no bones about it. And now he's turning around and he's saying, he's not only my brother or my half-brother, well, he doesn't say that, but he's my brother, younger brother, or older brother, excuse me. I'm not only his younger brother, I'm also a slave, born into slavery. Now, the Bible discusses this in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 and verse 18. It's from the Greek word doulos. And it's simply, you were slaves of sin. So you're going to be either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. I know which master I would rather serve. I don't want to serve the one that serves the slave or is the master of sin. I wish I could stand here tonight and tell you I've never fell for temptation. I've never sinned before, but uh, that would be a lie. That was my <laughs> newest sin. <laughs> we had a member of the church one time, and I i don't know where he got some of his ideas, but he, he said, everybody sins here tonight but me. What? He said, everybody sins. I don't sin anymore. What? And he was reading 
passages, but he misunderstood the Greek context. That's the original language. We don't live the life of sin. But because pride was always in his heart and he was always right, he, uh, you couldn't talk to him. You couldn't reason with him. And so that's why he justified himself by condemning everybody here. And I'm like, that doesn't work. We just let him go. And then he'd get over his temper tantrum about three or four weeks later. Come back. And when he didn't get his way, he'd do it again and again. Now, that's important because we're going to look at something that we looked at last week concerning the trials that we have in life. But James writes this to the dispersion, that is Christians, and the only Christians that they had until James's day was Jewish Christians. I know some people get kind of upset about that, but it's still the truth. I mean, the gospel is for everybody. That's not that's not what I said, but all we had was Jewish Christians. And so they, uh, they uh, would get together and where they came up with some things they got a hold of, I don't know. It sounded right. It sounded good, but it went back to that old religion idea that the three friends pulled on Job. Can't you see the obvious? I mean, God's trying to show this to you. And so the first thing apparently that is a big, big problem in the church is the question of trials. The question of bad times. I was talking to somebody this morning, and I said, well, how you doing? And she says, well, it's my birthday, and I'm not having a very good day. I said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, well, it's nobody's fault. It just, it just is. I'm sorry. What a way to spend your 47th birthday, huh? And, uh, and I'm looking at my shirt on the way to church tonight, and I, I swear up and down I didn't miss anything this big, but. Man, live, I, I was looking at that going like, man, that's embarrassing. 56 years old and can't even eat. <laughs> and we get into various trials. But I love the phrase he uses there in verse 2. We fall into. When you fall into various trials... It must mean that there's somebody that caused the problem. And the problem maker is our enemy, the devil. And he will do anything in, he, in his power to set up big enough potholes for us to fall. Now, you know, when I was a kid, man, I'd fall and I wouldn't think much about it. But now that I'm a little older, it's kind of like a guy had uh, heart surgery about uh, about two years ago when he was 83. He had another heart procedure not long ago when he was 85. And he said, this one is taking me a lot longer to recover than the first. One. And I'm like, I'll bet. I mean, my land's at 85 years old. I hope I'm doing that well. I hope I make it to 85. Um, but we fall into those traps and yet they're not a waste. They're not a waste. Look at what he says in verse two, my brethren count it, consider it, chalk it up as an accounting term that it is that you count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I, I know I'm going to be looked at like, what in the world is he trying to do? But um, one, of the, one of my favorite things to eat is ice cream. I, I, I like about any ice cream. I was talking to a fella about 35 years ago, and he said, 
you know, Dwayne, he said, the thing that I had to stop eating, he said, I had to give up my ice cream. And he said, do you know how difficult that was for me to give up? I said, oh, to be told you couldn't have it? Oh, man. And he said, yeah, I had to give it up. I'm like, whoa. Now, you get a bowl of ice cream. That's pretty good. How about seven bowls of ice cream? Somebody says, well, how big are the bowls? <laughs> no, you know, you can't eat and not feel lousy or not feel like you're stuffed to the gizzards, as I would say, if you ate seven bowls of ice cream. Well, why do you eat ice cream? Because it's good. And James says all of our trials are for our good. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us. That does not make one sense to us at all until you read verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Patience is there in the New King James, but that's not the right word. It is an enduring perseverance. You just keep on keeping on. Now, that's pretty easy when things are going pretty well. It's easy when you feel good. It's easy when you don't have anybody pull out in front of you. Uh, it's easy when everybody's nice to you and you're nice to them. How about when they're not? <laughs> That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when the friction starts taking place. And what do we do? Well, what we should do is just keep on keeping on but we just, we get that version, that mild version of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And when somebody yells at us, in fact, I, I was kind of laughing a while back, but it wasn't funny at the time. If I hadn't moved out of this parents, this dad's way, he would have knocked me to the floor and probably punched me because he didn't get his way. And the kid was trying to tell him he didn't want to do what the dad was wanting him to do. We were trying to honor the kid's request. And people were looking at me and said, how in the world could you put up with that? Well, it wasn't easy. We got berated, me and the other principal got berated one time for four and a half hours and called every name in the book and called racist, uh, my favorite of them still is that I'm racist against white people. That's still my favorite. We laughed about it. We laugh about it now. That's the idea James is given. Look, it's not very pretty at the time, but if you let patience, verse four, if you let it have its perfect work, it's going to produce in you that perseverance that we all want. What we would love to do is we'd love to be perseverant and just like, okay, just poof. We're the most perseverant people. That isn't the way God operates. And so he says in verse five and six, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it'll be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. So verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exultation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as soon as the flower of the field, because as a flower of the field, sorry, he will pass away. 
For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flowers falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. It's not wrong to be rich. When I was growing up, that's what I was told. It's wrong to be rich. That's not what the Bible ever taught. And there are some people that say, well, this rich man is not a brother in Christ. Well, that doesn't make any sense either. Because James is not writing to anybody. He's writing to the church. And we get to chapter four or chapter five, excuse me. And you're going to see that some of these rich Christians are withholding the pay from non-rich Christians, the poor Christians. And James says, you can't do that. I don't care if you are the master. I don't care if they are the slave. You cannot do that. You can't withhold their pay. And you can't short your master in work. Do it as you're doing it to the Lord. Well, James comes in and he, he, he goes back to what Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 7. There's one equalizer among everybody, and that's death. Death comes to everybody. Whether you're rich, whether you're old, whether you're poor, whether you're young, whether you're whatever, death comes to everybody. And nobody's going to take it with them. Contrary to what the Egyptians taught, Nobody's going to take it with them, contrary to what some people think. I had a friend of mine one time, and you know, sometimes I wonder if he wasn't being serious. He said he was talking to a funeral director over at Silver City and said, there's this casket they've got, and it's got a, a keepsake. It's got a little safe in the middle of it. And I said, you know what's so neat? I happen to work at the funeral home and I know where that is. So what you do is you put all your money in that and Vern and I will write you a check and we'll take the money. I think he was kidding because I do know his wife would have killed him over and over again had, had he really done that. But we're not any better than anybody else. They're not any better than we are. I don't care if, uh, you know, you see one of these TikTok things and and uh, you get this, this snotty girl or this snotty guy who thinks God's gift to humanity. No. They may act that way, but it's still going to be the same problem. And that's why he would, he would bring up and, and lead to this concept about trials in one specific area. Now, this is one of the most shocking things. And where they got this, well, I guess the devil, I don't know. I, I do not understand this. My, uh, my grandma was a very faithful Christian, but my grandma was a little too rigid. She, uh, I mean, it was going to be thus saith the Lord and nothing else. And so she loved to read Barbara Cartman and Harlequin romance books. And I didn't care. So, I mean, if she wants to read those is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In my opinion, you may disagree and that's fine. But one day, just to aggravate her, I said, hey, Grandma, can I take your car and go up to Clyde's and buy a Playboy? See, what my grandma said was, it wasn't wrong to read those books as long as you just read them. If you saw any pictures, that was wrong. You heard me. And so I said, so Grandma says, uh 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 no, you can't go get a Playboy. And I said, well, why? Uh-uh. 
And she kept on going and kept on going for a minute. And I said, well, you read Bar Barbara Cartland and Harlequin Romance books. Well, she had to think of an answer. She went back to her old answer to my mom and my aunts. Well, it's not wrong if you read it. It's wrong if you see it. Grandma, I'm not going to look at the pictures. I'm going to read the articles. I did this intentionally. I know you can't believe that. And, and I kept on and kept on. And, you know, she wouldn't let me go buy a Playboy. I wasn't going to buy one anyway. It would give you a relax. It would make you relax. But do you know that the brethren were teaching that since I had access to that Playboy magazine, they weren't teaching it today, but this is, this is what they would completely agree with, that since I had access to that Playboy magazine, God made that accessible for me and that I could read that all day long, even if I was tempted to and I'm going to be honest. I'd be tempted to do it. And, and since God made it available, God sends temptation. God sends temptation. And I was trying to think, trying to remember in studies, where did they get that? Other than what they could see. And James says in chapter 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Temptation is real. If you don't fall for it, or excuse me, I'm sorry, if you are tempted, that doesn't make you a sinner. I know there's some people out there that try to tell you that, but you tell them for me they're full of prunes. The Bible is very clear. Being tempted is not the sin. The, the sin is when you fall for it. And I'd love to stand here tonight and tell you I've never fell for temptation. That'd be another lie too. And James says, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, people are very quick to go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 12 and 13. And I think sometimes we have taken that whole passage out of context. However, it does fit when verse 12 says, Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has been given you except is common to man. Let me explain what I mean by taking out of context a minute. But God has made a way of escape so that you will not have to fall for it. I, I think if you kept it in the context, I'm just giving you Dwayne Springer commentary here. You don't have to take it. But I think if you keep it in the context, all of those people that he speaks of and he speaks of the Old Testament characters, the Old Testament children of Israel, all of them have the same problem. Not all of them fell for the same temptation. For example, chapter 32. Moses has been up on the mountain for, uh, sorry, Exodus 32. Moses has been on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. And all of a sudden, oh, Moses has got to be dead. So Aaron, make us a calf and lead us back to Egypt. And then Aaron goes and does one thing further. And he says, this is the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And when Moses questions him, he says, well, I'm telling you, I, all I did was I threw jewelry in there and I came calf. Talk about God being merciful. I think if I'd have been in charge, I think I'd have just zapped Aaron right then and there. <laughs> but God's God, I'm not. However, what does fit in that context, though, is the fact that there's no that God has limited Satan into 
the things of temptation. He can't do everything he wants to do. There's not one thing that that will tempt everybody, but there are things that will tempt others. I've always been called weird because they, they had a good person running the concession stand at the high school. We'd go down to Candy Island. I'd just be about sick. I just I was trying to get out of there as fast as I could. I was fighting three people trying to get them out of the candy aisle. <laughs> and I didn't blame them. And sometimes when we all worked hard, they got they got a candy bar out of the deal. No problem there. There's nothing wrong with eating candy bars. Don't misunderstand here. But they just they just make me sick. So Satan studies us all out. Satan studies us all out. And that's why you have people who go, can you believe what so-and-so fell for? And then others are like, yeah, but I don't blame him. I'd have done it too. But don't make the mistake that God sent it. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That word enticed simply means tricked into Satan always says I've got a better way than God does only to realize that when we fall for Satan's devices he didn't have a better way God had the better way but he makes things look so good I mean who's more comfortable with sin God or us you know which one that is that's us oh now there's nothing wrong with it if people can't see what's going on. Weren't that wasn't that what we were told in the 90s? Wasn't that what we were told as long as you know what people do behind closed doors doesn't affect the society. People got so angry with me because I said Bill Clinton should have been impeached and removed from office. Because what he did with Monica Lewinsky. And they went, well, it was between two consenting adults. Yeah, but the problem was they did it in the private office that we pay for. How they, of course, I have a conspiracy theory with that, and it doesn't really matter. But And, and here's what Satan knows. Look at verse uh, 14. Each one's tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth what? Death. Death is not annihilation. Death is separation from God. I do not envy those parents on the border that trying to come to a better life. And, and I know I take a lot of criticism for this, but I, I just can't imagine what it must be like for a parent to get separated from their child in that mess. And, and where their child is. We by sin are separated from God. Verse 16. Now, here's what James says the problem is. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift comes from God above. With uh, Down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then verse 19. Now let me read it to you the way we wished it was said. Let every man be swift to speak, slow to hear, 
and quick to wrath. James says you can't get to wrath if you'll do what I'm telling you. Swift to hear. Swift to hear. There are a lot of people that like to talk, but they only like to hear themselves talk. They don't want a conversation. They want to interject to where they talk. And let me illustrate it. Oh, we're in an IEP. And I, they, uh, the person running the IEP said, uh, it was on a student that I was working with, and said, uh, well, Mr. Springer, it's your turn to, to, to talk. And I said, okay. I didn't want to be there because I already knew what was about to happen. I was doing something else I'd like to do, and that it was duty and helping the principal out. And this individual, when I got ready to speak to Grandma, because that's who was in charge, she, this lady, took her hand, not just like this, took her hand and went, stop! And I went. And the grandma was looking at her and everybody was looking at her. And I went, what was that all about? And I was like, I told the guy running the IEP, I said, don't call me to another one again. He started laughing. I, I was joking with him. But a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. I mean, when you're wrong, do you like it when somebody says you're wrong? That's what happened to that kid this afternoon that was yelling at me and trying to get in a fight with another kid because he heard something. He heard it all wrong. I hope he figures that out. But it was amazing. It's amazing how people don't want to be swift to hear. Look at verse 19. Let so my brethren, let every band be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You you think about this for a minute with me. You've got a doctrine that you've believed for years and years and years and years only to find out it's wrong. We, we had some people at home. My granny had such a sweet spirit, she could talk to them, and she used to, they would tell her. I know the Church of Christ is right. But you see, I was born a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist, and I'm going to die a Baptist. And Granny says, but you don't want to go to hell. And they would look at her and go, well, I guess I will. It was as though it was no big deal. But in reality, there are some people that they'll do this. Well, now look, I know what you're saying is right, but I believe what I believe for so long and I'm not going to. That's what was happening to the brethren here. And James says, no, 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 no. God sends good gifts. Aren't you glad he does? Don't get the idea that temptation is something sent by God. The trials are sent by God and that whatever you do with the trials, even if you behave inappropriately, God won't hold you accountable for it. There's just no way. And we're going to talk about, we're going to come back to verse 19 and 20, Lord willing, next time when it comes to the word of God. Because really, wasn't that the problem? Yeah. The real problem was they weren't taking this book very seriously. Just give you a sneak preview. Look, verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow with wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And what were they not doing? They weren't doing anything the word of God told them. Why do I say that? Look at verse 22. 
be what? Hearers of the word only? No, be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only. But you can't be doing that if you're not reading it and you're not taking it, you know, somebody says, well, there's certain things I don't like reading in the book. All right. I empathize with you. I don't like reading in the book. What are we supposed to do with the people that treat us spitefully? Bless them. Pray for them. Well, I don't like doing that. Because, you see, every instinct in me tells, tells me I should do what they're doing. No, nope, doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it right at all. But it's tough sometimes, isn't it? Christopher and I were over at the bank one day making a church deposit, and this guy, it sounded like to me, and of course it wasn't any of my business, we could only hear just parts of it, and that's all we wanted to hear anyway, that it was something pretty simple, but because their computers wouldn't go be, be able to go back more than three years, that the manager who was at lunch, and it was 1245, and she was going to be back in about 15 to 30 minutes. And, and he was just getting so irritated because he didn't get his way. And the lady that was dealing with him said, I'm sorry. He said, you'll have to come back then and you have a good day. And he was, you could just see the veins in his head. And, and when he finally walked out and I said, well, now you know how I feel, how I felt when I was an administrator, <laughs> you'd have people making unreasonable requests. But if you do things biblically, and I'm by no means perfect, but if you do things biblically, it pays off. Because what's going to be able to save you? Right here. This is what's going to be able to save you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time tonight. We pray that we've used it wisely. And Father, we pray for those who weren't as lucky as us to be here tonight. Father, please be with us as we go home. Keep us safe and in your care. Forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.